Hi, this is Hugh Tilson. I'm having an interview, a wonderful conversation. This is no interview, is it, Paul? Uh, uh, with Dr. Paul Halverson. He's the dean of the Fairbanks, the new dean of the new school, no longer new after five yeah. years, uh, Fairbanks School of Public Health with Indiana University. Uh, and the principal investigator for this extraordinary Du Beaumont funded, ASTHO supported, IU based study on uh, public health success. Right. So thank you so much for joining me in this conversation, Paul. Uh, in addition to all your other roles, you are a former state health officer. It's been my honor. That's right. So Paul, uh, right at the key, or at the core of our study is this, this concept of success as a state health officer. What is success? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I'll answer that question by first telling you a bit of a story. When I when I first arrived in Arkansas as the state health commissioner, you may remember it was after the unfortunate and untimely death of Dr. Faye Bozeman, who was in that role and died of a, um, in a farm accident. And that in and of itself, you know, was a public health issue. But when I first came to be in that role, I had a chance to go around to all of our 75 county and counties and 93 offices. I did that over the year. But one of the first trips I made, I actually went to a rural part of Arkansas and had a chance to really drive in the neighborhoods and the small towns. Usually that meant going on dirt roads and frequently it meant uh, just trying to get a sense of where people live and what, what their conditions were that they lived in every day. So I knew it was, inherently I knew it was different than what I lived at. What I found was, and I'll never get it out of my mind, is um, children playing in a dirty street. Um, and there was just something about it. You know, they, as, I, as I talked to people in the community, I discovered that many of these kids hadn't had a, anything to eat. I mean, there really were problems in terms of malnutrition and, and just not having the sense that they'll really have um, a full meal and not really um, having the advantages, I think, that a lot of, a lot of people, um, we'd all like to say that our kids can grow up and have a carefree life, and these kids didn't. And it was interesting to me, it set the stage for what to me is success, and that is being able to intervene, to create the conditions under which people really can be healthy. And it, to me, they take it another step for, forward and say, it's really about giving kids hope, right? And not just the kids, but their parents. And as we all live together in communities, uh, it seems to me that one of the most important things that we could strive for in terms of public health is the success of providing the opportunity for people to have hope that tomorrow will be better than today. And that there's reason to believe that because of public health, there is a better tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, it maybe it sounds corny, but to me it was a driving force to say, you know, we can do better than this. And, and so that has been on my mind, along with a number of other things, about how I wanted to change the way that we lived and worked and played and, 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 and were together as community. This man. Uh, what what are the components of success? How do, how do you get there? What are the factors that you need? Well, to me, I think it starts with an understanding of public health science. You know, we we talk a lot about how public health is uh, over time has uh, eroded in many ways. We've lost capacity. In some cases, I would say we never had that capacity. Right. So. Uh, but I think uh, we need to begin our work with a strong foundation, a scientific basis of what we call public health. It's, I guess, per perhaps one of the reasons why I'm most interested in education. Practical, practice-ready education that focuses not just on theory for theory's sake, but theory to help us better understand what the most effective evidence-based strategies could be and that allows us to better understand and to be a critical consumer of that information. So number one, 
the factor is a strong foundation in public health science. Number two is an understanding of how communities work and that we collectively, we, we need to help engage with communities. We need to be able to be trusted sources of information. We need to help communities understand their options and the importance of public health and, and why health is at the cornerstone of their economic development and the cultural development of their community. So having that understanding of community and the leadership that it takes to be able to lead from behind, lead in the front, lead in a way that allows people to believe that and to really know that we are partnering together to improve their health. So um, and third, I think from a, from a practical perspective, uh, the way we move organizations is having a good, solid understanding of management and leadership. Um, we know that leaders can be taught. Um, and my hope is that we and public health will do a much better job of training people to lead well. And there's good information out there and it's available. We just need to use that information. Um, so, and third, I guess, uh, Fourth, I don't know, I'm lost track, but the idea here is that I think we need some zeal. Um, we need some zip. We, we have to have hope ourselves that things can get better. And that enthusiasm that we have, I hope, will spill over to, to others. So that zip, the leadership and management um, uh, experience and knowledge, um, the public health um, science, and the leadership within the community and a, a real sense of authentic community engagement. I think all four of those things are really important as we think about the factors or the, the pillars, if you will. Let's, let's apply it. Uh, remind us where you were state health officer and what years you served. So I was the uh, state health officer in Arkansas uh, from 2005 uh, to 2013. And during that time, you had a lot of challenges and some yep. real doozies. So just drill down on one. What was, the, what was the biggest challenge, biggest issue that you faced in that time? Boy, that's a really tough question. It seemed like uh, every day was a new challenge. I, I often said that it was the best job I ever had. Some days I, it was both the best and the worst day uh, the, that I've ever had. Um, um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I suppose that one of the biggest challenges um, was the, the challenge of, of demonstrating uh, to the governor and to the legislature the importance of public health as its own agency. Um, you may know that when I, I came as the state health officer, it was in the waning days of the Arkansas Department of Health. And um, it was, uh, the organization was slated for consolidation to become part of the Department of Health and Human Services. There was this well guy that was the, uh, um, the director of uh, what was now the, the new Department of Health and Human Services, John Seelig, a terrific guy, wonderful career person, had uh, primarily focused on um, children and Medicaid, and it was a huge agency. But what happened was is that public health became one of 13 divisions within the new health and human services uh, area. And despite all of our great intentions, you know, when the governor says, I, I need to have the top three issues for your agency. And if your agency contained health and 12 other things, sometimes it was competition to decide whether you'd even get one thing that would be mentioned as a health issue. And so, you know, the idea was this we could save money by consolidating our health department with human services, and so why wouldn't we do that? Part of it was because I don't believe that people really understood the importance of health. Um, and so it was a good intention, great people that were trying to make it work, but over a relatively short period of time, uh, the legislature and our new governor decided it was time to reverse course. That health was too important to simply be buried in an umbrella agency that didn't have as its primary purpose protecting and improving the health of the public. And I, I remember when the governor, I talked with him and he said, you know, it's just too important. You 
need to have a strong voice in supporting public health. I need to hear directly from you. It needn't be filtered. It's important enough that in our state, health is prominent uh, as its own agency. That was a challenge, not just to me, but to public health overall. But we were able to convince the governor and the legislature in a way that was professional and respectful, but the importance of being our own agency. And that set then the stage for a number of things that I'm quite proud of, including the passage of the tobacco tax increase, um, which also at the same time occurred with the passage of legislation that substantially created the trauma system for our state. We were, I think, among the last states in the country to have an organized trauma system. A trauma system that included not just the big city of Little Rock, but, but all of our state. And I, I, I can't help but believe that that's one of the most lasting um, things that occurred uh, it was the creation of this system and the number of lives saved by essentially employing what we know about injury prevention and control. So a lot of things went on that I'm quite proud of. Uh, a lot of work went on by some very talented people. It was my privilege to have worked with and creating uh, an important team or groups of teams that worked on a lot of different projects. There were a number of challenges, um, but that's just one. What I want to, want to hear is what leadership skills it takes for a state health officer to lead that kind of change. Well, I I think uh, I think leadership is important in in introducing and sustaining change, um, <clears throat> but I think it's a different kind of leadership. If you think about it, it's not what you're selling; it's what you're actually able to get people to to not be not just be attracted to the idea but to actually embrace the change as something that is theirs and that they can see the purpose and the benefit to them to their organization to their jurisdiction whatever the unit may might be i think in the case of public health particularly as we think about state public health and large initiatives uh, take for example tobacco addiction we know that's the leading cause of death uh, in all states and still today, um, we, while we have literally millions of people dying of tobacco-related diseases, uh, and we know how to deal with it, but we're not. I would say to, to you that I think that public health's greatest failing in terms of our leadership is in our inability to take what is uncontrovertible evidence, particularly related to tobacco, and just employ evidence-based solutions that we know work. We know how to deal with tobacco addiction, but our challenge in public health is convincing others the importance of making a change, creating a political change that is, will ultimately lead to improved policies that have the greatest likelihood of reducing addiction uh, to tobacco and ultimately improving the health of the population. That's, a, that's just one example, but to me, it's the complexities of those elements necessary for people to embrace a, a, a different way of believing. And so if we can't uh, succeed in that area, it, it's very difficult to imagine doing um, all of the other things that we need to do as successfully, as quickly as we need. And I think that's probably the other thing is, is, um, is having both the urgency, um, but also the patience for the long haul. Um, we do our work every day. I, it's hard to get people excited or urgently engaged in policy development. And yet we know that that's probably one of the biggest and most direct ways in which to influence the health of the public is through policy-related initiatives. And yet it takes time and energy, and we need a lot of people to come on board with us. So again, that's an important strategy for us as public health leaders. But then again, also working with our medical care colleagues is also a critical element. And I find one of the most exciting parts of our job is actually working with the medical care system as they begin to, to, uh, to find public health. 
Um, we, they may call it population health, uh, and we know it is public health. We know there's differences in those terms, but at the end of the day, when we're all working together to improve the health of the people, it's, that's what it's all about. And to me, um, building strong relationships, creating win-win situations, and uh, incrementally changing our systems really is what will, will allow us to be successful. Uh, you know our study is all about change and turnover too. Um, uh, remember, or think back to your onboarding. I mean, you became a state health officer unexpectedly and very quickly. Yeah. Were there some things about being a state <clears throat> health officer that you didn't know but wished you had when you stepped? Oh into those my shoes? goodness! Yes. Uh, uh, you know, it's interesting because you may remember when I was at. I used to be at the CDC. Spent a lot of time as the director of the Division of Public Health Systems Development and Research. I thought I actually knew this job fairly well when I was at CDC because my entire division was focused on trying to support state and local health departments. Uh, I worked very closely with colleagues at ASTO. Uh, little did I know that I'd actually be a state health officer. And as you know, when Dr. Bozeman died, um, unexpectedly in, a, in the farm accident, it, it kind of got thrust upon me. And it was one of the things that was a defining moment for me to recognize that that job would fall to me uh, through, Dr. through uh, Governor Huckabee's uh, appointment. Um, I thought I knew it, and I realized that more every day that I was in that job, I realized I had so much to learn. Um, and, I, and through my colleagues at ASTO and the health officers uh, that I worked with across the, the country and especially in the surrounding states, we, I, I had a chance to learn, um, but you know, if you if you remember during that period of time, it, um, our public health laboratory was uh, uh, our very existence was at risk because of some technical violation, and not to diminish it, it was an important issue. But you know, I think I was the the first public health laboratory in the country to be shut down. Um, you know, well, who knows uh, what that's all about? I, all of a sudden even though I understood a little bit about how laboratories were working and certified and I understood CLIA, it was an important uh, under undertaking to be able to get us back in business so that the people in Arkansas would be served by a functioning public health laboratory. Um, but, you know, that, that was one issue among many that, um, you know, were initial obstacles. But the reality is um, every day you recognize that as much as you study the science of public health and the importance of leadership, you get a chance every day to try it out again. Um, the other thing is, as you recognize with nearly 10,000 people um, that were in the employment, uh, either as an employee or contractor, um, that's a lot of people. Keeping everybody going in the same direction is a real, a real task, and communicating uh, is so important. And I perhaps didn't, I underestimated actually how complicated and yet how important uh, continuous communication and goal-oriented um, focus was in terms of communicating what's important and how things are going to change and how they need to be part of it. Um, it it's, it's a complicated job. It's a wonderful job. But uh, I, I credit a lot of the, the success that we had uh, to the training that I had both at CDC and in the uh, State Health Leadership Initiative. Um, a lot of uh, good and important training that came, but also perhaps even more important is uh, the relationships I've built with other state health officers and our colleagues at ASTO who collectively created a supportive learning environment that allowed me to be able to take some of these naughty issues and, and have a conversation, learn from what others had done. Um, I think the worst part of um, being the state health officer would be uh, hunkering down and trying to go it alone without any understanding of your peers or uh, what others have done before you. For, so for some reason, we in public health believe we have to reinvent everything. And the reality is that's a really big waste of time. We need to learn what has worked and imitate that, customize it if you need to, but uh, we need to, to do a better job of networking and, and customizing known solutions. And, and I, I guess that was also an important learning for me. 
We're also studying departure uh, and how you can prepare an agency for your leaving. Uh, so what was your experience in leaving Arkansas? Was the agency prepared? Should you have done something different? How do agencies handle turnover? Yours was not precipitous. Sometimes they're precipitous. Yes. Well, again, I get part of the issue is creating a, an organizational structure that makes sense, that's built upon good organizational design principles, and then filling your top leadership positions with people that are both uh, technically knowledgeable and experienced enough to stay the course. And uh, I think that we were able to do that at the Arkansas Department of Health by uh, being very selective in our appointments of senior staff, uh, finding people who were in it for the long haul. Um, I was very fortunate uh, to have an incredible senior staff, um, terrific people that ultimately um, succeeded me um, and I'm pleased to say, I, I think that for the most part, the organization went on without too much of a hiccup. Uh, first of all, I, was, I got more involved in national efforts at the, uh, for ASTO and had the privilege of being the, the president of ASTO for uh, a year and then all of the activities related to being in national office. Um, so I had a terrific deputy uh, who ultimately became the state health officer, and Dr. Nate Smith is a terrific uh, state health officer for Arkansas, has done a, a, an incredible job. Uh, and he, he was able, I think, for the most part to maintain the structure that we had developed. Um, there wasn't a major departure strategically from what we had been doing um, and was able to maintain a, an important uh, uh, position of uh, and have a continuity both of leadership and strategic initiatives. And that doesn't mean that he hasn't changed things and he needs to. Organizations always need to change. But uh, I believe part of this, the, the success of a, of a show when he leaves or he, he or she leaves is that the organization uh, needs to be able to move on without you. And probably one of the greatest uh, feelings of accomplishment that I had was to see that the organization was able to continue to function very smoothly. Uh, and it didn't mean to say that uh, people didn't wish me well and say goodbye, and I had a chance to thank them. Um, but the organization needed to go on for the people in the state, and it did. Um, I think, you know, the, the old adage, you know, when you first uh, get this job, uh, keep your resume in the right-hand drawer because you never know when you might need it. Um, you know, people said that. I heard it. I didn't believe it. Uh, but then, you know, over the years, as I saw others leave pretty quickly after their appointment for various reasons, mostly not their fault, um, I, I realized that we're in a very tenuous situation. So maintaining good relationships and understanding that, um, you know, you're never guaranteed that next day, but, uh, but we, we need to make the most of every day that we get. So, um, for me, uh, when the opportunity came to, um, to be the founding dean at the Fairbanks School of Public Health, I was excited. Uh, I think that I was ready, uh, and the organization moved on. Great segue to the next thing we need to talk about. I mean, I think you may be the only dean we're interviewing in this project. Uh, so talk about the relationship between uh, academic, academic public health and practice, particularly state public health. Well, and many would remind me that when I was at CDC, I railed uh, about the disconnect that occurs and, and exists between, generally, between academic programs or schools of public health and practice. Uh, probably the biggest part of the issue is, is that schools of public health have incredibly dedicated faculty, most of which have never stood in a health department. And they, while they have great intention, they may not necessarily know what good public health practice looks like. I'm really um, pleased to say that uh, my school of public health uh, has chosen as its uh, sort of uh, major strategic challenge. Uh, they want to they be a school that makes a difference, that advances the health of the people uh, in the state of Indiana. It, you know, that's a, that's a big difference. Uh, there are schools, I believe, that just say, look, we're going to do great research and hopefully it'll be funded well. 
uh, we're going to graduate a lot of students and, uh, and, and we'll serve on committees and isn't that enough? And I say to them, it is not, in, it is not at all enough. Because if we don't focus our attention on ultimately doing good research that is translatable into action, if we don't train our students that are job ready, if we're not focused on practice rather than simply serving on committees, then we're not fully getting what public health is about. And so I am a strong believer that um, public health practice is that um, common ground between uh, the schools and programs in public health and um, the practice of public health demonstrated at, a, at governmental agencies, either at the local or the state level. And that we need to have very explicit common ground and, and recognize that we're in a partnership the state health agency has a responsibility to conduct public health, and our job is to help support them and to help lead innovation that would ultimately lead to improved health. We're never going to have enough money to do all that we believe should be done. But if we are doing our job with our research, we can find better and improved ways in which to make a difference. And if we continue to work on innovating in our teaching, our new uh, public health officials uh, with their degrees from our schools will do a great job and will help lead uh, public health into the future in a new vista that we haven't even imagined. It, it really is a good and important partnership and when it's working, it's great. The problem has been a disconnect between our funding in schools of public health and our needs in the practice world. And that's something from a policy perspective we need to address. But I think it takes a concentrated uh, focus by both our deans and our state health officials in particular to focus on what's really important and to find that common ground. So Paul, the future is extraordinary, but particularly for state public health, uh, there's some yeah. great opportunities on the horizon. Well, I think, I think there is an incredible opportunity as we think about the future. Number one, I think uh, our partners in the medical care system, the healthcare systems, are incredibly um, able and interested partners as we move uh, away from fee for service to a value based uh, orientation, as it is now important to them as it is to us to keep people healthy, to make people healthy, to create conditions under which people can be healthy. What has been our raison d'etre is now also of interest. Uh, and more of an int more than just a casual interest, but a business necessity for our health systems, we can take advantage of that common interest and move towards a strategy of, in of both integration and uh, and deployment of evidence based strategies to protect and improve human health that we have never been able to do before. We never had the money. We never had the influence, and now we have the opportunity to help drive uh, important change in our states. Secondly, I think uh, as, it, as it is increasingly the case, we're in the middle of upheaval around uh, 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 health care reform, and we need to put health into health care reform. And I think, again, we're seeing great examples across the country on how public health is able to influence the deployment of a new version of health. And especially as we think about Medicaid reform, you know, if um, there's a lot of things that are perhaps challenging within our current healthcare system, one of which is uh, the differences in our Medicaid program. I believe, regardless of what ultimately passes in our health reform legislation, that there will be greater demands on our states to, to do something to customize, if you will, Medicaid to the needs of the people in each state. I think that then creates the opportunity for health departments, both local, state, and schools of public health in those states to collaboratively work towards trying to better understand what the needs and opportunities are for you know, changing the Medicaid program, which is such a vital an important safety net in our communities to being even better in terms of being able to address uh, health issues for us. Um, you know, the other thing is there's so many different ways in which we collectively need to concentrate our efforts. I would suggest we need to find just two or three things in each of our states 
develop coalitions and partnerships to move us towards that and move and work as hard as we can uh, to really accomplish those things. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced there's nothing we, can, we can't do if we set our mind to it. We've got great science, we've got terrific leaders, um, we've got great partners, what else do you need? Couple of seconds left. Uh, first, give a shout out to being a state health officer after you're no longer a state health officer. That is the alumni. Yes. Well, so there is life after being a show. Uh, it's a terrific life. Uh, I have had the privilege of serving as the president of the Alumni Association at ASTO. And I have um, contacts with incredible colleagues and dear friends. That's the one thing about being a state health official that's a little bit different than perhaps any other occupation. You're either a state health officer or you're a member of the Alumni Association and that's it. Or you're dead, I suppose. Uh, but that's, that's the whole strategy of keeping people and moving forward. So yes, there is, uh, there's terrific opportunities after being a state health official. And I think all of us have in common as alumni members the importance of, of holding up, supporting, and helping our current shows to be as successful as possible. But ultimately, we're all interested in the long game, which is improving and protecting the health of the people of this country. And finally, this is your bully pulpit moment, Paul. You're in front of the camera. You're talking to new shows, probably. Uh, what do you want new shows to know? As a new show, um, there's a lot of pressure for you to move forward. Um, and I think unfairly, you think you have to be perfect. And you're not. And the quicker you get over the idea that everything that you do, whether it's every decision you make or every speech that you do or, or decision you move forward on, it's not going to be perfect. We need to recognize that uh, no matter how smart you are, you don't know everything. Uh, and most importantly, um, there is just there's help around the corner. Call on colleagues, uh, other state health officials, ASTO, members of the Alumni Association. Everyone is here to help. We have a vested interest in your success. And as a state health official, a new state health official, you're entering a part of your life which I think will be the most exciting, most productive, perhaps in some cases the most frustrating job you've ever had, but it also is the most rewarding because when you can look in the eye of that child or that dad or mom that didn't have hope before, that because of something you have done, uh, have a new feeling of hope and optimism for their life, then it's all worth it. So Paul, it may be true that you aren't perfect, but you're mighty darn close. <laughs> Thank you.